Welcome to the Behavior Change Architect podcast, a conversation about innovative and evidence-based behavior change strategies designed to increase well-being. Tune in to listen to thought leaders, industry experts, and innovative scientists discuss hot-button topics surrounding specific behaviors, design, and communication strategies. Host Dr. Carrie Evers takes you on a journey to change the discussion, change perspectives, and ultimately help you change behavior for your clients, populations, and perhaps even yourself. Hello, and welcome to the start of the second series of the Behavior Change Architect podcast. This series is initially being released in January of 2022. It's the start of a new year, and hopefully we've all settled into writing 22 instead of 21. And it's also about this time that many of us start thinking about those resolutions we had for New Year's. Did you make any? How are they going? And if you didn't make any, is there a reason that you chose not to? Well, New Year's resolutions are all about changing our behavior. And so this series of the Behavior Change Architect will be all about resolutions, why we make them, how we keep them, and what we do if we get to this point in the year and start to slip. To start off the series, I'm excited to have as my guest the expert on New Year's resolutions, Dr. John Norcross. Dr. Norcross is an internationally recognized authority on behavior change and psychotherapy. He is distinguished professor and chair of psychology at the University of Scranton, clinical professor of psychiatry at SUNY Upstate Medical University, and a board-certified clinical psychologist. He is the author of more than 400 scholarly publications. He's co-written or edited 25 books, and his work has been featured in hundreds of media interviews, including appearing on shows such as The Today Show, CBS Sunday Morning, and CNN. And I'm really thrilled he is here with us today. Welcome, Dr. Norcross. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Carrie. I'm pleased to join you. Great. So let's start with some background on making resolutions for the new year. Is there a history behind this? There is indeed. Resolutions are steeped in that history. In ancient times, Romans made resolutions of good conduct to the god Janus, for whom the month of January is named. The Babylonians, in fact, began each year by pledging to pay their debts and to return all their borrowed items. Medieval knights, is another example, during their final Christmas feast, reaffirmed their commitments. So there is a strong historical and psychological tradition of trying to improve ourselves when the calendar switches a page. Wow, so, um, so this isn't just something that we came up with in kind of current times then. So how many people or how many Americans make New Year's resolutions? Well, about 60% of Americans declare their intention to make a resolution when we ask them in December. But come New Year's Day itself, it's about 35 to 40% will actually do so. Wow, so it's it's less than half of Americans who make those resolutions. Um, And and it always feels like such a huge topic of conversation in in the new year. Why do you think more people don't make them? Well, it is a little less than half. Uh, In one of our studies, we asked exactly that question, Carrie, and it turns out that about a third of Americans say they're just kind of irrelevant. Uh, They have nothing to change, no interest in them. Um, Sadly, about another one third of what we call non-resolvers cited their previous ineffectiveness as the major reason. They said they just can't do it, and tragically, they give up trying at all and then the the kind of the the remainders are pretty much just indifferent to it all lots of shrugs lots of i just don't know why i don't do it Uh, but i must tell you um, as a fellow behavior change enthusiast and clinical psychologist i think this is a huge wasted opportunity Uh, this new year's resolutions constitute the largest annual effort to improve our collective behavior So when people don't try, it's one of those opportunities missed in life. Yeah, I I mean, it seems like so many people talk about them, but from what you're saying, it sounds like not a lot of people are actually making that commitment or actually working on them in January. 
But for those who do make resolutions, what are some of the common ones people make? I imagine that from from people I know and the topics of conversation I have, I imagine weight loss is one of the top on the list. Indeed it is. In dozens of surveys and studies, weight loss emerges consistently as number one. Uh, resolutions run the gamut of self and community improvement, but the vast majority concern health, money, and relationships. So health, including losing weight, is starting exercise, stopping smoking. Money are such resolutions as improving finances, creating a budget, getting a new job. And then the third large category are relationships, uh, directly or indirectly. But they don't end there. Uh, we've had people to start playing the piano, to improve their tennis game, to be a little nicer. It really resolutions span the impressive breadth of human behavior. So I'm, I'm interested to hear you say that in terms of um, you know how much they span, because I know in some of your work, you talk about how resolutions sometimes have the reputation of being very individualistic and puritanical pursuits for self-improvement. Um, but it sounds like that's not always the case. Can you talk a bit about how we can change that perception or if we need to change that perception? Well, they certainly need not be directed toward your own individual behavior. Resolutions can instead center on improving the community or contributing to your family or to the greater good beyond oneself. Several colleagues in the United Kingdom in particular have tried to alter the perception from these individualistic take something away from yourself to give something to the community. And resolutions need not reach unrealistically high standards or critical expectations. Giving yourself a break, being a little nicer to yourself is too rarely a resolution, particularly during the pandemic. And I, I love hearing you um, talk a little bit about the pandemic and, and also that it's not always about taking something away, that sometimes it's adding something, like you mentioned, the piano lessons or, or improving something. Do you have a sense of how the uh, COVID pandemic might have influenced resolution making last year and this year? Yes, as society and the economy go, so go resolutions. During COVID-19, more resolutions center on mask wearing, social distancing, vaccine taking, and of course, our desired return to normalcy. So resolutions invariably both reflect and reinforce such social changes. Interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how they go uh, next year as we move into 2023. So one of the things I wanted to bring up, and I, I've heard you talk or mention this in articles before, I had read in an article um, in the Journal of Clinical Psychology that stated there is an 8% success rate with resolutions. And that was attributed to your research. But I now understand that statistic is very wrong. Um, can you talk about that and what your research has actually shown? Sure. Uh, that constitutes a huge failure to fact check uh, by the media. The actual success rate is about 40%, Carrie. So they're wow. way off. They just misreport uh, one of our studies. Our better um, and more recent studies consistently show that about 40 to 44% of New Year's resolvers will actually be successful at six months. So contrary to public opinion, a considerable proportion of New Year's resolvers do in fact succeed. Another uh, recent experiment in Scandinavia found that at the end of one year, about 55% of resolvers thought they did fairly well. So it's at least the cup is probably almost half full. Now, as you know, as a researcher, Carrie, those rates are probably higher than the actual successes because in our studies, we have repeated contacts with resolvers and that phenomenon known as reactivity probably increased their behavior change. So I suspect in the real world, it may not be 44% or 55%, I prefer to say it's probably around 40% success. Nonetheless, that's a lot higher than the pessimists repeatedly tell us it is. 
<laughs> There's a science. The science says 40% people routinely achieve their New Year's resolutions. That's that's great, and that's much higher than um, I actually expected. And you mentioned about this study in Scandinavia, and that brought up a question for me. So it's not just Americans who have this concept of a New Year's resolution, it sounds like. Um, certainly not. Resolutions are taken around the world, of course. Um, they tend to reflect some of the language and culture. As I mentioned, some of our more communitarian or socialist colleagues tend to take more community-oriented resolutions. The United States, being more individualistic in nature, tend to make more individualistic resolutions. But some fascinating and creative cross-cultural research shows that the science works pretty much the same across cultures. There's this deep need for behavior change. Interesting. That's great. And you just used a term, um, and I know you use this in some of your writing, you use the terms resolvers and non-resolvers. Can you just explain the difference between those? And does, does it really matter in terms of if people are resolvers or non-resolvers? It matters substantially. In fact, one of our studies, we tracked hundreds of resolvers and non-resolvers for six months. About 42% of the resolvers succeeded come July 1st, whereas only 4% of non-resolvers did. So that's a tenfold increase. Now you ask about our definition of those. In our studies, we wanted to compare people who were taking New Year's resolvers to people with similar problems, similar desire to change, but decided they were not going to try to change that behavior come January 1st. So in this way, we matched or controlled for the type of problem, their motivation, their history of the problem, and then systematically followed people who resolved come January 1st, and the people who, who again, were aware of the problem, had the motivation to change it, but just decided not to change it. So that's how we define our subsets of resolvers and non-resolvers. And as you can see, there's a tenfold increase when you make the concerted effort to actually work on that goal. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. So is New Year's the only time people can be a resolver or can make a resolution? Oh, hell no. People make <laughs> resolutions all throughout the year. They may not call them resolutions, but we are inveterate behavior changers. So that may be on your birthday, 40th birthday, Lent, Yom Kippur, the beginning of summer. Um, more broadly, this is just how we make and sustain our behavior change. In fact, a dirty little secret that I rarely um, share, but I'm not really interested in New Year's resolutions. It is <laughs> simply a research convenience. It's when 40% of the population are going to change a behavior at the same time. So it's quite convenient to follow people up. Whereas if you just follow behavior change at any other time, you're having to call them at different times. But everybody begins on January 1st. So that's largely why we've conducted the New Year's resolution studies. It's much easier on my research assistants. <laughs> that's that's great. I mean, talking about having everyone start at the same time and know what the timing of the follow-ups are going to be. So is really making a resolution kind of uh, similar to making a decision or making a commitment? Is it just another word for that? Because since you can make a resolution at any time? Well, yes and no. Yes, the process is very similar to initiating and maintaining a successful behavior change. But no, in a different way, the, the new year, by tradition, has people more thoughtfully and systematically preparing. Uh, in fact, in our studies, uh, we ask people well before January 1st if they are going to take a resolution this year. So in that way, there's more in the stages of change model we might call the preparation stage. They alert people, they make a public commitment, they begin making the small baby steps toward the resolution. 
So yes, in one sense, it's very similar like any other successful behavior change, but no, in another sense, there's a lot more lead time and publicity surrounding New Year's resolutions. Interesting. So as we talk about resolutions, it sounds like you're saying there's not really a difference in the science when people make changes at other times of the year, other than the fact that they're getting a lot more support from the society because of the timing. That's correct. And probably a longer formal preparation stage. Interesting. Okay, great. Um, so in one of your writings, you stated, and I, I love this quote, um, follow what research says actually works. There is a science to behavior change, which, you know, that that's the whole theme of this podcast. Um, the intent of the podcast is to talk about the science of behavior change. Um, so I just wanted to talk quickly, specifically for New Year's resolutions. Um, there's so many people right now who are probably working on resolutions um, that they made in January. And now that we're in mid-January, they may have been having trouble keeping them or have already abandoned them for 2022. So what were some of the things we could have all done before January that would have helped us be more prepared to keep our resolutions? Well, our research studies distinguishing between the successful and the unsuccessful point to several uh, methods. The first is to make realistic attainable goals. Vague goals beget vague resolutions. If you can't measure it, you can't touch it, it's probably not specific enough. Hundreds of studies show that goal setting boosts the, our behavioral success. Second, we, sh we should try to frame whenever possible that resolution in positive or affirmative words. Several studies uh, show these approach-oriented goals are more effective than avoidance. So increasing healthy exercise is better framed than saying, I'm going to reduce the amount of time I sit. And in January, during that preparation stage, we strongly encourage everyone to develop a specific action plan. I'm always asking, tell me concretely, what are you going to do differently to counter the problem? And finally, and this is a bit controversial, I'll admit, but the science is strong here. Publicly declare that resolution. Public commitments are generally more successful than private decisions. Now, you said that some of that is controversial. What is controversial about those public statements of a commitment? That you potentially set yourself up for some embarrassment or shame. Uh, and I know some people try to avoid that, but that, on the other hand, also serves as a source of motivation. So we sometimes call this the push-pull. You want to be pushed toward the desirable future, but that may also mean that you're pulled from the shame and the negative that was in the past. Interesting. Okay, great. So now we're in the middle of January. Is there anything else we should be focusing on to keep our resolutions going? You bet. And that science to behavior change that we both want to shout from the rooftops says we should continue to track our progress. So record, chart, or journal that change behavior. We psychologists tend to call this self-monitoring, but it increases the probability of watching and keeping the resolution. Next, make sure you're rewarding your successes, small though they may be, in January. Reinforce yourself for each step with a healthy treat or compliment. You know, and a lot of people also forget to arrange their environment to help rather than hinder uh, themselves. So the science says limit exposure to high-risk situations and create reminders uh, for that resolutions. Leverage your environment to trigger healthy responses. And finally, expect occasional slips. You know, one of the most amazing findings from our resolution studies showed that 71% of successful resolvers slipped early in January, but that first slip had actually strengthened their efforts. So just know you're, you're not going to do calculus perfect the first time. You're not going to hit a perfect tennis backhand every time or bake perfectly the apple pie the first time. 
Slips simply demonstrate you're trying. So don't give up on the first slip. Listen to successful resolvers who say those slips actually strengthened and rekindled their commitment. So hopefully everyone heard that. Everyone who's struggling right now with some of their resolutions. If you're struggling or if you've had a slip, don't let it get you down. Um, it'll actually help you move forward. So uh, with that, with so many people struggling to keep their resolutions, um, you just gave us some of those statistics. Do you still recommend people make them? I absolutely do. Um, I'm frequently approached by people saying, shouldn't we just avoid these resolutions? They don't work anyway, which we now know is wrong. Uh, in fact, the calendar list uh, ditch your New Year's resolutions date in late January. Uh, I'm very clear about this, Kerry. Resolutions can and do work for millions of people. Instead of ditching it, we should recalibrate and refocus our resolutions. We should remember that these behavior change improve lives. And when it comes to weight, smoking, and some of them, they can literally save lives. So let's learn what's working and what's not working for you. Reset the priorities. And I'll say it again, there's a science to behavior change. Follow that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much uh, for this first episode on resolutions. Dr. John Norcross, we're thrilled to have you here. And we are going to continue the conversation in our next episode where we'll be talking a lot about Dr. Norcross's book, Changeology. So we hope you will join us then. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavior Change Architect podcast. To continue the conversation, visit our website at www.behaviorchangearchitectpodcast.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.